I wonder if any of you can recognize these plants. Uh, growing up in Kentucky, these plants were very familiar to me. These are actually tobacco plants. You're probably wondering what left it with acid. You'll find out in a little bit. Actually, both of my grandparents were tobacco farmers back in Kentucky. A couple things. Uh, we've talked about how to categorize acids. We first said they're strong versus weak acids. And we said strong acids ionize 100%. And we use that one-way arrow to represent the fact that they ionize all the way. And then we said there's weak acids, and they ionize less than 100%. We use that two-way arrow to represent the fact that they do not ionize 100% or every single molecule doesn't lose its proton. Another way we categorize acids is when we name them. We said there's a group called oxyacids, and then there's a group of acids without oxygen. For example, for an acid without oxygen, such as HBr, we always include that prefix, and we call it hydrobromic acid. Whereas an oxy acid with the polyatomic ion bromate becomes bromic acid, and there's no pre prefix hydro. And now we're going to talk about a third category, which we'll get to in a little bit, which is a way to categorize acids, which is a number of acidic hydrogens. First, let's go back to our discussion of oxy acids and non oxy acids. So, we talked about acids that are oxy acids. And on the oxy acids, the, the acidic proton or the hydrogen is actually attached to an oxygen. So, there are acids without oxygen, and then there's oxy acids, which is a, is a big category, and those are acids with oxygen. Now, within that category, we're going to talk about two things today. One of those is organic acids. Organic acids are very important. They contain the element carbon. Now you can see of all these acids here, only one of these is an organic acid, and that would be acetic acid. It has the element carbon in two places, so that's an organic acid. Now notice phosphoric acid has three acidic hydrogens, and each one of those is attached to an oxygen. And then the same thing is true for nitrous acid. It's got a hydrogen attached to the oxygen, and the same thing is true for hypochlorous acid. Now, an acetic, an acetic acid, there's only one acidic hydrogen because these three that are attached to the carbon are not lost as protons. So, for that reason, acetic acid, uh, in acetic acid, the only hydrogen that makes it an acid is this one right here that's attached to the oxygen. So, let's look at that category a little bit closer, the oxy acids, the ones that have oxygen. So, in that group, we said there's a category called organic acids, and specifically, there's a functional group we're concerned with called carboxylic group. A carboxylic group is when you have a molecule, and in that molecule it contains a carbon, double bonded to an oxygen, and single bonded to a hydrogen. Now you see that represent, represented here by a COOH. And here I have a drawing of the molecular structure. We see the carbon is attached to a double bonded oxygen, but that acidic hydrogen is right here. It's single bonded to that oxygen, and that's those two oxygens let that hydrogen leave without an electron, and that's what we call a proton. Whenever a hydrogen leaves without an electron, it's just simply a proton. So that's a very important group. These two structures you may recognize. One of those that the top is the acetate polyatomic ion. The thing at the bottom is actually acetic acid. What's important about both of those in our discussion is they contain the carboxylic acid. So they're organic acids and they can't contain that carboxylic acid group. We see this here. I'll circle it in the polyatomic ion. Now notice this is, doesn't contain the carboxylic acid group because the hydrogen is not attached. But in the acetic acid below, I'm circling the entire carboxylic acid. It contains a COOH, and that's what makes vinegar, acetic acid, and acid is the fact that it contains that carboxylic acid. So at the top we have acetate ion, and notice there's two ways to write that. One is you can say CH3COOH, and when we do that, we're just giving the, the form in which it bonds. A carbon is bonded to three hydrogens, which is bonded to a carbon, and then two oxygens are attached to that carbon. Or simply we condense all those and we say C2H3O2 with a negative charge, and that may be the one you're, uh, with which you're more familiar. Now when we add an hydrogen to that, we have acetic acid or vinegar. And we could write the formula for acetic acid or vinegar as CH3COOH or HC2H3O2. Now let's look at both of these structures. First of all, the, one of these contains a carboxylic group or the COOH. And so you may recognize as one of these as being a carboxylic acid. The other is not. Let's see if you can pick it out. Hopefully you selected the first molecule. It's got a COOH. Now let me tell you something about the way these structures are drawn. Every bend represents a carbon. So we have a six carbon ring right here. 
And then we have another bend right here, and so that represents another carbon. The two lines represent a double bond, so this is actually C6H6, but substituted here, we have a, a carboxylic group, and then we have an OH group, and this is an alcohol group, not a base. Now, it's this one, it has one acidic hydrogen on the structure, and I'm circling that right there. So that uh, this is important in tobacco plants, and this ties into the first uh, drawing that you saw, or the first photograph. And tobacco plants actually have a cool mechanism. Like uh, they can get infected with something called a, mo a tobacco mosaic virus. And when that happens, the, uh, the tobacco plant uh, secretes something called salicylic acid, which is the first structure. Now what it does, salicylic acid is a precursor for methyl salicylate. And methyl salicylate actually helps mount an immune response and helps kill the virus. Another cool thing that tobacco plants do is uh, if they're infected by uh, caterpillars, caterpillars can actually kill, they're like a parasite that can infect and kill tobacco plants. What they can do is they actually pr produce a chemical that is a precursor again, and this would actually in turn uh, attract wasps, which will kill the caterpillars and help, help the tobacco plant li uh, continue living. So even on something like a tobacco plant, acids and bases can have a big effect. So let's keep going about our discussion. There we have a tobacco plant, and there's a wasp that has been attracted to the, to the tobacco plant, uh, killing the caterpillar. So let's continue with our discussion here, and the last group or way of categorizing acids, categorizing acids is by the number of acidic hydrogens. Now, if they have one acidic hydrogen, we call it a monoprotic acid. Now, hopefully you've heard of that term mono, like monotone, you talk at one tone. Mono just means one. So it means there's one acidic hydrogen. So, for example, one acidic hydrogen, here's an example, HNO3, nitric acid, a monoprotic acid. HNO2, nitrous acid, a monoprotic acid. And this one may surprise you, acetic acid, a monoprotic acid. Now hopefully you remember from our previous discussion why is acetic acid monoprotic? Well it's got this one acetic hydrogen right there that is acidic but these three are attached to the carbon and are not acidic and so it is truly a monoprotic acid. Even though it has four or four hydrogens attach, attached to it, you can only lose one as a proton. Now the next category of acid contain two acidic hydrogens and we call those diprotic acids. An example of that would be sulfuric acid or carbonic acid. So that those are both diprotic acids. The last category would be triprotic acids. A good example of that, they have three acidic hydrogens, would be phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Now one thing we can do is we can group the, these two categories, the, the diprotic and the triprotic together, and have a group we call polyprotic, P O. L Y polyprotic. So we could say we have a monoprotic acid or a polyprotic acid. Monoprotic means it has one acidic hydrogen. Polyprotic means it has more than one acidic hydrogen. The last important thing we want to talk about is the ionization of polyprotic acids. So you should be able to write these reactions and remember when you do the ionization occurs with one proton at a time. And as you're doing those reactions, each reaction should be balanced for atom and for charge, and we'll try and emphasize that as we go through the steps. So for example, let's say we take phosphoric acid, which is our triprotic acid. It combines with water, and it loses one of those protons. And so water is no longer H2O, it's now hydronium ion, H3O+, and what's left behind is dihydrogen phosphate. So notice in this, the H3PO4 is the acid, water acts as a base, Hydronium is the conjugate acid, then dihydrogen phosphate is the conjugate base. Now, notice it's also balanced for atom and charge. We have five hydrogens on the left, five hydrogens on the right. We have one phosphate on the left, one phosphate on the right. And then, in addition to that, we have one extra oxygen, one extra oxygen. And there is a net charge of zero on the reactant side, a net charge of zero on the product side. Let's continue. Now notice this is a not a complete reaction because we have the two-way arrow. Now what we're going to do next is take this dihydrogen phosphate and it's going to continue to react with water. So here's the second step. Dihydrogen phosphate reacts with water and produces a hydronium and hydrogen phosphate ion. Now in this, notice it, it lost one proton to produce hydronium. And in doing so, we have four hydrogens on the left and four hydrogens on the right. 
we have one phosphate on the left, we have one phosphate on the right, or the product side. And in addition to that, we have one oxygen, one oxygen. Now notice the net charge on the, le on the left is minus one, because water is zero. And then on the product side, it's minus one as well, plus one and a minus two together equal minus one. So that reaction as well is balanced for atom and charge. So let's try the next one. And in the next one, we see a hydrogen phosphate reacts with water, and it produces a hydronium ion and a phosphate ion. Now notice, notice this one is also balanced for atom and charge. We have a hydrogen phosphate here. We see one phosphate, one phosphate. We can do that because the phosphate's present on both sides. We have three hydrogens, one there and two there, so that gives us three hydrogens. We have one oxygen and then one oxygen. Now notice there's a net charge of a negative two on the reactant side, and then if we sum the positive one and the negative three, we have negative two on the product side. So this reaction as well is balanced for atom and charge, a very important concept. Now notice when we're doing these reactions, whenever we talk about it, uh, that a proton is really the same as a hydronium ion. So H3O plus or a hydronium is equal to H plus or a proton. Thus, the reaction that we just did could be written this way. We could say phosphoric acid goes to a proton plus dihydrogen phosphate. Then we could say dihydrogen phosphate goes to a proton, proton and hydrogen phosphate. And then the last step, we can take hydrogen phosphate goes to a proton and a phosphate ion. So both of those are equivalent ways of writing the same ionization reaction or the reaction of the acid with the water. And one last thing we want to do is talk about the specific ionization of a special acid called sulfuric acid. Now hopefully you remember sulfuric acid is in a special category. It's a strong acid. Now what do strong acids do? Strong acids lose every single one of their first protons. But the other thing that's interesting about sulfuric acid, it's weak for the second proton. So let's look and see how this happens. So first, sulfuric acid reacts with water. Now notice what I've done here is I've showed a one-way arrow. You get, end up with a proton and HSO4 minus. So the first ionization in, uh, of that is 100%. It goes completely. So that's 100%, and that's why we have the one-way arrow. So at the end of this reaction, there was no sulfuric acid left. Every single bit of that goes into a proton and a hydrogen sulfate ion. Now let's look at the second step. We take the hydrogen sulfate ion, and notice this time we have an equilibrium arrow pointing both ways, which means it doesn't go completely. Now what happens here is you produce a proton and a sulfate ion. Now this reaction as well, notice both of these are balanced. We have one hydrogen, one hydrogen, one sulfate, one sulfate, minus one, minus one. It's balanced for atom and charge, but this reaction doesn't go 100%. I love chemistry. I love chemistry. I love chemistry. I love I love chemistry.